Hello comrades, it's the Finnish Bolshevik. Today I'm going to be looking at a video by the Libertarian Socialist Rants called Leninism vs. Socialism, the USSR. Firstly, I think it's unfortunate that Libertarian Socialist Rants video is not actually a serious, constructive critique of Soviet-style socialism, but it's pretty much just a propagandistic attack that doesn't provide the historical context and it doesn't provide any kind of actual alternative to Soviet-style socialism. It's pretty much just saying the Bolsheviks were evil and that's pretty much it. Now, in his defense, I will say that he has not invented this argument himself. He's getting it from his source, which is a pamphlet that he links in the video description. My purpose here is not to hate on anarchists or to hate on libertarian socialist rants or anything like that. Instead, what I hope to accomplish is to provide some historical context and give the anarchists an understanding of why the Bolsheviks chose the kinds of policies that they did and what purpose they served. In this video, I want to outline how the Bolshevik revolution failed because the institutions of workers' control were undermined and dismantled, and how the state undertook the role of the private despot. So right from the get-go, we start with a pretty propagandistic approach. The typical definition of socialism is abolition of private property. So it is collective ownership of the means of production. Now, anarchists, they like to focus on worker control of the means of production, which is not exactly the same thing, and it's also pretty difficult to define what exactly worker control means. And this is going to become pretty evident in the course of this video, but I just wanted to point out that the anarchists like to talk about worker control because then they can make their argument that Bolsheviks supposedly didn't have worker control. Because we all know that the Bolsheviks did abolish private property, so in that sense they clearly did build socialism. They did create collective ownership of the means of production. He then goes on to claim that Soviet socialism supposedly failed because it didn't have worker control. In my opinion, that's false. It would be better to argue that Soviet socialism became revisionist and then failed because of a lack of democracy. That would be a better argument and even in that case, I wouldn't claim that that was the main reason, and certainly not the only reason, but that would certainly be a more valid reason than saying that they didn't have worker control. Now, firstly, let's talk about what does property look like in socialism and communism. Both Marxism and anarcho-communism want a similar type of end goal. Not necessarily an identical end goal, but at least it's fairly similar. In communism, you should have all the means of production owned by society as a whole. This is the only way you're actually entirely negating private property, is if the means of production are owned by the society as a whole. Certainly for communism this is the case, but I would argue that even for socialism this should predominantly be the case. So in communism, you should only have societal ownership. However, in the transitional phase, which we call socialism, you basically can have two types of ownership. You can have societal ownership, where the means of production are owned by the society as a whole, and collective or cooperative ownership, where the means of production, for instance, a factory or some kind of workplace, is owned by the workers who work in it, but it's not owned by the society as a whole. That's a cooperative workplace. Anarchists have always been big advocates of cooperatives. Marxists have as well, but Marxists have clearly also supported state-owned industry, whereas anarchists obviously don't. So anarchists and some other people, they prefer cooperatives. For them, it is an attractive idea that you have a workplace which is owned and somehow controlled by the workers who work in it. They like this idea because it doesn't involve the state. And it's also very local and grassroots. But what they fail to understand is that that's not actually compatible with communism. It is compatible with a very low level of socialism, but not communism. For communism, we need everything to be owned by the society as a whole, not just by individual separate co-ops. And for that, you actually want the economy to merge into a bigger unit, instead of splitting into smaller pieces. You want more centralism, instead of more decentralism. 
workers took the opportunity to create their own organisations, factory and shop committees, whose demands weren't limited to wages and hours, but were beginning to challenge the premises of capitalism. These popular organisations were a significant threat to the system. The Bolsheviks took power on October the 25th, and the dismantling of workers' control began. When Libertarian Socialist Rance talks about this supposed contradiction between the state and the workers, that's not actually what he's talking about. In reality, he should be talking about a contradiction between the narrow local interest of some local committees versus the interest of the whole country and the entire class. The role of the workers' government is to serve the interests of the entire class as a whole, even if it goes against the wishes of some local groups that either want more local control, more local power for themselves, higher wages for themselves, or whatever. And this is the real question. These factory committees which arose spontaneously, organically, they simply took control of their own local workplace. And this happened before the revolution, this happened under capitalism. Now, when the Bolshevik Revolution happens, the Bolsheviks actually begin trying to organize a workers' government, a workers' state, that would eventually become a socialist society. And it shouldn't be too difficult to understand why, for the interest of strengthening the revolutionary government, securing the revolution, strengthening the economy, and especially when the civil war starts, to strengthen the Red Army's war effort, that the Bolsheviks would say, we want to have a government body which determines, broadly speaking, what direction the economy is going to take, and which would organize things like, all right, we will have material sent here, here, and here, and investment put here, here, and here, which will allow us to produce this, this, and this for the war effort. Instead of just having each of these factories just do their own thing with no regard to the country as a whole. And don't get me wrong, most of these factory committees were not anarchists. Most of these factory committees were not opposed to a worker's government which would guide the nationwide economic policy. The Bolshevik position, which is also the position that I agree with on this issue, is that the local workers should have some level of control over how they do things in their own workplace. There should be some level of local control and some level of local autonomy. But at the same time, there has to be some kind of nationwide collaboration and nationwide plan of how to do things. Because it can't just be about how you want to run your own little workplace. Because you don't exist in isolation. It's about how the entire class in the entire country does things. So I think it is dishonest and not very useful when the anarchists simply claim that Marxism is against worker control or something just because we are against individualistic local control. The Soviet Union had a worker government. As I've already stated many times, this is not some kind of disagreement between the workers and a capitalist government or something. So let's actually look at the Soviet government. How was the Soviet government actually organized in this period? The local councils of the factories, towns and villages, the local Soviets, they would select delegates which they would send to the All-Russian Congress of Soviets, which was the sole legislative body of the government. That was the body that created all the laws. That was the government. So it was a couple thousand delegates selected by local worker councils. They literally formed the Soviet government. They formed the sole legislative body, which was the All-Russian Congress of Soviets. The Congress of Soviets then, from its own members, selected an executive committee, which was hundreds of people, and would basically administrate the country when the Congress of Soviets was not in session. This was the executive branch of the government, once again created out of delegates sent by the local councils from factories, towns and villages. On top of that there were the 18 ministers, the people's commissars, representing various specialized branches of the government. The military, foreign affairs, also economic policy. 
So think about this in practice for a couple seconds. So Libertarian Socialist Rants says that these local factory committees are good. So when the local factory committee then selects a delegate who gets sent to the parliament to represent them, then all of a sudden when he's in the parliament he becomes an evil bureaucrat. Then he becomes an evil dictator or something. But the deputies in the parliament are literally chosen by the local committees. And then these deputies choose an economic minister. Now, this is hierarchical. Obviously it is. A minister of some part of the economy clearly has more influence than an individual worker. That's obvious. But such is representative democracy. Now, maybe libertarian socialist rants is a big advocate of direct democracy instead of representative democracy, which is a fair opinion to have. If you watch, for instance, Paul Cockshot's videos, he's a Marxist economist, and he certainly is an advocate of direct democracy. And I would also agree that you should have direct democracy whenever possible. It's just that Marxists don't think that it's always possible, if we're being realistic. When it comes to really technical, detailed economic planning, then realistically you're going to need some kind of experts to be taking part in that. And what Paul Cockshot was suggesting was he said that there should be an economic planning body together with some kind of um, auditing body selected from random citizens who would then oversee the economic plan. And I think that makes sense, because you do want to have checks and balances, but at the same time you do need to have some level of hierarchy. If it's a matter of economic planning, then you really should ask an economist. And I know that anarchists, I think there's a Bakunin quote about this, where anarchism basically agrees with this, at least in principle. Okay, in Soviet Russia, the nationwide economic policy was drawn up by experts, by economists because that's obviously the smart thing to do, especially if you are in a war, and you really don't want to mess things up. The libertarian socialist rants attacks this as some kind of betrayal of socialism or something. But how would the anarchists themselves have done this? Well, we actually know how the anarchists did this, because we can just look at Spanish Catalonia, when the anarcho-syndicalists had power in 1936 to 1938. And you know what? They had an economic minister. Yes they had an economic minister. Now, is that hierarchy? Is that representative democracy instead of direct democracy? Yes. Is that simply the smartest thing to do? Absolutely. Which is why they did it, despite the fact that they were anarchists. They did it because it was obviously the smart thing to do. It was obviously the necessary thing to do. So anarchists really shouldn't attack us for doing something that is just obviously the correct thing to do and they themselves do the exact same thing. Let's talk about worker control. Anarchists like to claim that it was the goal of the Bolsheviks to just get in power and then stamp out all worker control. Now, was this actually the case? Well, it definitely wasn't the case. Like I already said previously, the government that the Bolsheviks created consisted basically only of workers. Any honest anarchist can't legitimately attack the Soviet government, or the Bolshevik party for that matter, for not being a working class organization. Of course the party and the state were purely working class organizations, or working class and peasantry. We know that that is not the anarchist critique. The anarchist critique is that they were hierarchical. So let's look at worker control in concrete terms. Since anarchists always talk about worker control, but what exactly is it? And did the Bolsheviks just try to eliminate it? Well, even the term workers' control actually comes from the Soviet government itself. So the idea that they tried to somehow stamp it out actually kind of starts to fall apart as you look into this. Quote, Workers' control was the slogan for the new Soviet government after the revolution in Russia. Lenin made this point in his speech on the first anniversary of the revolution. Workers' control is a matter of education and power. As Lenin pointed out in his speech, socialism can only take shape and be consolidated when the working class has learned how to run the economy and when the authority of the working people has been firmly established. As he says, this cannot occur quickly. It will take them a long time to learn to run industry, but we consider it most important and valuable that the workers have themselves tackled the job, and that we have passed from workers' control, which in all the main branches of industry was bound to be chaotic, disorganized, primitive, and incomplete, 
to workers' industrial administration on a national scale. Lenin considered it key that the trade unions had taken up a responsibility in workers' control. The trade union's position has altered. Their main function now is to send their representatives to all management bodies and central bodies, he said. The key, says Lenin, is the workers' consciousness. By political consciousness, we mean that they have tackled this formidable task with their own hands and by their own efforts, and they have committed thousands of blunders, from each of which they have themselves suffered. But every blunder trained and steeled them in organizing industrial administration, which has now been established and put upon a firm foundation. They saw their work through. From now on, the work will be different. For now all workers, not just the leaders and advanced workers, but great sections of workers, know that they themselves, with their own hands, are building socialism and have already laid its foundations, and no force in the country can prevent them from seeing the job through. End of quote. Now, does this sound like he wants to abolish workers' control and he wants to get workers out of running industry and running the economy? No, of course not. And what we discover is that the Bolsheviks were not really struggling against worker control, but they were trying to figure out what kinds of forms of worker control work. Let's discuss the creation of the first system of workers' control in Soviet Russia, what role the factory committees played, and what the Bolshevik attitude towards them was. Quote, The formation of the committees responded to a simple conception in the conflict with the employers. The workers were ever ready to follow the committees, but as yet they followed with none of the labor discipline and class consciousness which are the real basis of the trade union movement. The trade unions, on the contrary, being less concerned with petty, local and private interests, realized far more vividly than did the factory committees the necessity of improving economic conditions." Unquote. Now, what was the problem with the factory committees? Why were they concerned with merely local interests and private interests? And why did they lack class consciousness and discipline? Because compared to the trade unions, they were much more divided, split up, isolated. They were not under any kind of organized command structure the same way a nationwide trade union would be. They were much more just individual committees doing their own thing. They were not even necessarily collaborating with other committees. Of course, you did see cooperation between committees, and the Bolshevik government tried to facilitate this and tried to help this, but you also saw competition between rival factory committees. You even saw some local factory committees uniting with the capitalist of their factory against another factory's factory committee. Quote, the first task assigned by the communists to the trade unions in 1917 was to collaborate actively in the organization of the economic life of the country. The trade unions were requested to concentrate their attention, first of all, on the organization of workers' control. This question was the subject of a decree dated 14th November 1917, one of the earliest decrees of the new government. The decree stated that control shall be exercised by the workers in each undertaking as a whole through the medium of their duly elected representatives. The decree further provided for the setting up of 1. Regional control commissions attached to the corresponding Soviets and composed of the representatives from the trade unions, factory committees, and cooperative societies. And 2. An all-Russian workers' council for workers' control composed of 10 members from the Central Executive Committee of the Soviets, which means the government, 5 from the ACCTU, meaning the trade union, five from the Central Office of Factory Committees, five from the Agriculturalist Union, and one or two members from each of the Central Union offices, etc." Unquote. The Bolsheviks did not want to stamp out the control of the working class or anything like that. What they were trying to do was to create a functioning socialist society. They preferred the trade unions to the individual factory committees because the trade unions were more organized and more united while at the same time they tried to unite the factory committees and make them work in an organized fashion. Quote, These proposals were embodied in general instructions issued on 15th November 1917 for the enforcement of the decree on workers' control, whereby the government vested the entire management of workers' control in the trade unions. Unquote. Now, shouldn't all the syndicalists just be absolutely loving this? They're getting the trade unions to manage all the workplaces. If only there was a word to describe when the workers run their own workplaces through their organizations. Hmm. Oh yeah, worker control, that's it. 
This is worker control in action. This is what one form of worker control looks like. The government did criticize individual factory committees because they often only served their own selfish interests. They didn't collaborate together, they competed against each other. Now the Libertarian Socialist Rants points out that some of these committees were actually anti-capitalist and actually had political demands instead of just economic demands, which is true for some of them, but definitely not all of them. And if it's political demands you want, well, a political party, the Bolshevik party, has just overthrown the capitalist government. So there's political demands for you. Quote, In the Donitz Basin, the metal workers and miners, while mutually refusing to make deliveries of coal and iron on credit, are selling their output to the peasants without any regard to state interests, and all of this is being done in the name of workers' control. So these committees are refusing to make deliveries of necessary materials to the revolutionary government because they would rather just sell to anybody who has money. And they justify it by saying, well, hey, we have workers' control, we can do whatever we want. Well, I suppose you technically could, but that kind of thing is going to end up being the death of the revolution. Some committees even united with the capitalists of their factories against the workers of other factories in efforts to raise the prices of their products, etc. Quote, Most of the committees only considered the individual interests of their own undertaking, working irrespective of how the others were faring. They even went the length, in conjunction with the employers, of raising the price of the articles they manufactured. Unquote. Once again, due to this chaos, the Bolsheviks prefer the trade unions. A government body is created, called the Supreme Economic Council, and more responsibility is given to the trade unions. Quote, the unions were called on to play an important and even decisive part in the different national commissariats, the SEC, and other executive bodies of the nation's economy. This was an overwhelming task, and yet these duties, vast as they were, were subsequently added to by the nationalization, at first sporadic, but afterwards methodical, of the industrial undertakings. Unquote. Quote, the composition of the SEC was revised. Thirty out of sixty-nine members were appointed directly by the unions. At the same time, the unions were asked to direct the central organizations created and subordinated to the SEC. These were the Glavki, or the central committees, appointed to manage the affairs of various branches of industry. These organizations, about 50 in number, were managed by boards chosen by the trade union of the corresponding branch of industry and approved by the SEC. The real importance of the duties entrusted to the unions will be seen in the following summary of the duties of the SEC. The primary function of the Supreme Economic Council is to organize the economic activity of the country and the financial resources of the government. With these aims in view, the SEC will draw up a general plan and propose the necessary measures for the sound organization of national economy. It will also coordinate in a general scheme the activities of various economic organizations. The committee is dealing with the organization of the fuel, metal, and provision trades, the commissariats of commerce and industry, supplies, agriculture, finance, the army and navy, etc., the All-Russian Council of Workers' Control, and the various organizations of the working classes." Unquote. Now, let's look at systems of worker control in the Soviet Union after socialism was actually built. And I may do a video later that discusses this topic in more detail, but for now, let's just briefly go over some of the more basic types. As the trade unions proved very suitable for creating a stable system of worker control and industrial management, the Bolsheviks gave them a very substantial amount of power, both in terms of managing the affairs of the local workplaces, electing officials to represent them, replacing managers they didn't like, etc. Quote, the Soviet trade unions are massive organizations, uniting over 107 million members, or about 98% of the workforce. Unquote. Quote, the trade unions have powers to draft bills for consideration by the Supreme Soviet, the parliament, and to take part in the work of the parliamentary committees which process the bills. All trade union bodies are elective. All posts which carry with them policy-making responsibilities are elective. Unquote. The trade unions were also given a significant amount of influence in economic planning on the local level. The economists and planners in the State Planning Commission would create the big picture nationwide plan, together with the help of the trade unions. The unions operating from local workplaces would tell the planners, this is the amount we can produce, these are the production targets you should set, these are the resources that we need to fulfill our plan, etc. Quote, 
unions are able to play a strategic part in the planned development of the socialist economy. They, in fact, draw up the plans covering labor conditions and standards that are used by the State Planning Commission in working out its plans for the year and covering every phase of economic life in the country. The so-called counter-planning in each industrial unit and factory is conducted through the union committee. It works out the proposed production rate for the factory, as well as the work requirements for each job, consistent with the plans for the whole industry. The unions are clearly one of the most vital agencies in the Soviet Union." Unquote. Something along these lines is the type of compromise that you would want in socialism, because the workers should be able to manage their own workplaces. Also, the workers in the local workplace are the ones who have the accurate information about their own workplace, and therefore they should be involved in economic planning. But in socialism, you need nationwide cooperation, so you do need a compromise between the local and the nationwide interests. That's why you also have to send worker delegates to the parliament, which then appoints the planning commission. There were also the so-called production conferences. Quote, workers' conferences on production have a long history in the USSR, starting from 1921. They are part of a systematic national drive for participation of workers in production management and planning. The important characteristics of the SBCs, which concern us here, are that they bring together representatives of all sections of an enterprise to resolve current production problems, and like so many other forms of worker participation in management in the Soviet Union, are inconceivable outside a socialist society. They are a demonstration of the sense of community within Soviet workforces, where a problem facing any part of an enterprise is increasingly seen by workers as a concern to all. The SPCs are one of the basic forms of mass involvement of workers and employees in managing production, and are concerned with economic management of enterprises. The SPCs are an important form of socialist democracy, of public control, of practical involvement of the working masses in management. The membership of the SPCs is composed of workers and staff, representatives of the factory, office, local, and shop trade union committees, the management party and young communist league organizations, branches of the scientific and technical societies, and the all-union society of inventors and innovators. These are all elected at general meetings in shops and departments, remembering that virtually every eligible Soviet worker is a member of his appropriate trade union and the corresponding public organizations. At smaller enterprises there is no SPC, and questions of production are usually dealt with at general meetings of the whole workforce. The SPC meets as required, but not less than quarterly. Its work is prepared by a committee it elects, responsible for daily checking on decisions taken. It should be noted, in connection with the importance of workers' participation, that this representative gathering, the SPC, can take decisions on matters of production, within the plan and accordance with the law, which are binding on the management. When one considers that such a system of control operates in a situation where the trade union district committees have power to demand the sacking of any member of management, including the general management, and that it is common practice that an insistent demand results in dismissal, it would be a foolhardy manager who tried for too long to ignore the wishes of the SPC." Unquote. Then Libertarian Socialist Rants talks about the different kinds of laws and labor discipline of the government. So, the Soviet government, which consists of delegates sent by local worker councils to represent them, this government then enacts various laws. Because remember, the Congress of Soviets, which consists entirely of worker representatives selected by local Soviets, is the sole legislative body of Russia at this time. They enact laws such as, you can't steal, you can't loot. Now the anarchists, they then turn around and say, see, the Bolsheviks are protecting private property. But it should be fairly obvious why this is just ridiculous. Because in order to avoid total economic ruin, total chaos, and total societal breakdown, you really can't just have people taking things. Even when you're going to nationalize the industry, and even when you're going to take the workplaces and the factories into the hands of the workers, it should be done in some kind of orderly manner. 
And if your country is in massive turmoil, terrible economic problems, civil war and whatnot, you really don't need the additional destabilization caused by people just randomly deciding that they're gonna take this or that factory over and halting production there. This is not a betrayal of socialism to have some basic level of rule of law. Ask yourself this, do you really think that the Bolsheviks wanted to protect private property? Obviously not. They literally got rid of private property themselves. They literally got rid of private property. The Bolsheviks abolished private property much more than Makhno did. Makhno didn't do anything to abolish private property. Now, the government also did impose labor discipline. Basically rules like, you must show up at work at the time that has been agreed in your work contract. You must show up at the correct time. You can't be late. You can't be absent without a valid reason, or otherwise you will face some kind of penalties. Now, libertarian socialist rants makes this seem like some kind of crazy totalitarian idea, but it's literally the most sensible thing ever. What do you think is going to happen after the revolution? People are just going to not show up at work ever? No, even after the revolution, people still need to show up at work. They still need to perform their work. They can't be absent without a valid reason. The word labor discipline might sound scary to anarchists. They might think, ooh, labor discipline, that's spooky. But it's really not. Once again, I will point to anarchist Catalonia. They had exactly similar labor discipline and labor laws. They even called it the same thing, labor discipline. Quote, Another resolution by the CNT was that which was entitled General Labor Norms, and in fact dealt with the problem of labor discipline. In its explanation of this resolution, the CNT National Committee observed, The CNT has the responsibility of indicating labor norms, a regulation which indicates to everyone his rights and duties. Clearly, in establishing rights and duties, one cannot eliminate sanctions, since all and everyone is obliged to give the most possible in collaboration in the great work in which we are engaged, maintaining a war and overcoming an economy broken as a result of the conflict. Each enterprise would have an official responsible to the Technical Administrative Committee. These were the officials to administer labor discipline." Unquote. Now, does this sound like anarchy, or does it sound like Bolshevism? In both cases, in anarchist Catalonia and in Marxist Russia, they both had the same kinds of good reasons to be concerned about this, because they both faced economic difficulties, so they really wanted to make sure that people still keep working and producing so that the country doesn't run into any worse difficulties and so that labor productivity doesn't fall and that production doesn't fall and they both had a civil war to deal with. I know the idea that even after the revolution you have to work as hard as before, maybe even harder for some time to secure that the revolution wins. I know that that's not the most attractive idea but we better start getting used to that. The revolution is not a dinner party as Mao pointed out. Even after the revolution you still need to work and as a communist I think it's fair to say that you should be prepared to work harder than before to make sure that the communist revolution succeeds. This is literally why we call anarchists individualists, because they make complaints like this. Why do I have to work? Why do I have to keep working hard to support the socialist revolution? Why are they forcing me to work hard to support the socialist revolution? Well, if the revolution happens, are you gonna stay home and not work? Are you going to complain if they force you to work? Like, everybody else is literally dying out there, but you're going to complain if they make you work? Libertarian Socialist Rants goes on and on about how Bolsheviks were terrible because they supported Taylorism, which was a method invented by this one industrialist to try to make production more effective. Lastly, worker opposition. So Libertarian Socialist Rants and anarchists in general, they paint opposition to the Bolshevik government as some kind of great heroic thing. But what did this opposition, in actual concrete terms, what did opposition to the Bolshevik regime mean? At least in the economic sphere, I'm not talking about the political opposition of the right wing. I'm talking about in the economic sphere. It was peasants who were opposed to grain requisitions because the government was basically requisitioning food produced by the peasants at a fixed price so that they could give it to the cities and to the military and continue the war effort. Now the peasants, they really would have liked to get more money for their product. 
this was easily the most substantial, most serious kind of opposition was the peasants. And this policy was part of what was called war communism. And one of the reasons that the new economic policy was implemented after the civil war and why war communism was ended was because the peasants were not very happy about war communism. They wanted to get more money for their product. So was this some kind of heroic thing? Well, obviously not. I mean, it's understandable why they would want more money for their work, but it's also understandable why the government literally needed the food for the cities and for the army. It was absolutely necessary to win the war. The less significant type of opposition was by workers in industry and by bourgeois experts in industry. And basically this meant that certain people would strike demanding more money, more food, more material comforts, or more political power, more autonomy from the government. And obviously the government couldn't have this because they were literally fighting a war to the death with the class enemy. So they can't just have people saying, no, we're not going to work anymore. And they also really didn't want to give people any extra money because they didn't have any extra money. They also understood that it would set a dangerous precedent if they start saying that, okay, because you guys are striking or demonstrating, then that means that we're just going to let you do whatever you want. Laws decided by the Congress of Soviets don't apply to you. Regulations decided by the Congress of Soviets don't apply to you. You can just do whatever. The economic policy drawn up by the Congress of the Soviets doesn't apply to you. Obviously, they couldn't do that. Most of the time, things would be settled peacefully. Sometimes the government would have to crack down and stop the opposition so that things would return to normal, production would return to normal. Because as I said, this is not a dinner party, this was civil war. But even so, most disagreements and strikes were settled peacefully, and most of them were not even against the government and didn't have political motivations of any kind. They were simply demanding higher wages or bigger food rations. After all, it was a time of civil war and extreme hardship. Quote, 86.3% of strikes had economic motives and only 13.7% political. But the overwhelming majority of strikes, 73.9%, were classed as having been settled completely or partially in the workers' favor. Unquote. Quote, Many of the strikes in 1920 followed traditional patterns and initially represented reaction to harsh material circumstances rather than a protest against Communist Party labor policies. But food shortages could easily lead to attacks on the government trade monopoly or abuses. In December 1919, a representative of the Moscow Department of the Metal Workers Trade Union reported that the catastrophic sharpening of the food supply crisis has led to a spontaneous halt to work by workers and the calling of general meetings. February and March, when food supplies were particularly tight, constituted one peak of unrest, even though the food supply apparatus worked more effectively than in previous winters. Moscow experienced drastic problems with shortages, and as the situation deteriorated, discontent amongst workers escalated. At the end of March, the Moscow Communist Party newspaper published an editorial which noted that in the past days in Moscow, here and there, from time to time, strikes have broken out in individual enterprises. These strikes are connected with the severe food supply situation of the workers." Unquote. This is what Lenin had to say at the time, and from reading this, you can really see just how dire the situation truly was. Quote, the principal mistake we have all been making up to now is too much optimism. As a result, we succumb to bureaucratic utopias. Only a very small part of our plans has been realized. Life, everyone in fact, has laughed at our plans. This must be radically altered. Anticipate the worst. We already have some experience. It is slight, but practical. Food supplies. Frumkin says the ideal is 150 million puds from the tax, plus 50 million puds by means of exchange, plus 40 million puds from the Ukraine, equals 240 million puds. We must base our calculations on a total of 200 million puts for the year. What are we to do with this poultry starvation figure? Alpha. Take a minimum for the army, that is, calculate the ratios for a minimum army. Beta. Include in the plan the economic work of the army on a modest, extremely modest scale. Gamma. For office employees, drastic reduction. Immediately draw up a list of the best enterprises. 
close down one half to one quarter of those now running. Only those which have enough fuel and bread, even if the minimum quantity of grain is collected, 200 million puts, and fuel, question mark, for the whole year, put 70% of the members of the State Planning Commission to work 14 hours a day. Let science sweat a bit. We have given them good rations, now we must make them work." Unquote. So at a time like that, who is honestly going to criticize the Bolshevik government for wanting more organization, more planning, more order, more control about what happens to their resources and where they're being allocated? Lastly, there were the bourgeois experts, engineers, technical specialists, as well as workers in certain key industries and key sectors like the railway workers who were basically so crucial to the government that they could blackmail the government for more money. So when these bourgeois experts, railway workers, engineers, etc., when they would go on strike, the Bolsheviks were actually forced to grant them certain privileges because if those people went on strike, the entire economy and the entire war effort would collapse. And these people, such as the bourgeois experts, could not be replaced because those were the only experts they had. It was imperative that the Bolshevik government got these people to collaborate with them, and the only way to make it happen was to grant their demands. But these people who were striking were not some kind of heroic opposition. They were literally just exploiting the situation and blackmailing the government for more money. So the Bolsheviks gave them more money. And they were talking about the concept of a labor aristocracy because these certain industries, like the railways for instance, they were getting more money because they were blackmailing the government. So the Bolsheviks called them a labor aristocracy. Quote, Naturally, in a developed socialist society, it would appear quite unfair and incorrect for members of the bourgeois intelligentsia to receive considerably higher pay than that received by the best sections of the working class, stated Lenin. Under the conditions of practical reality, however, we must solve this pressing problem by means of this unfair remuneration for bourgeois specialists at much higher rates." Unquote. Quote, the specialists, to whom the new regime felt compelled to make concessions, were paid a wage 50% higher than that received by the members of the government. Unquote. Now, anarchists, put yourself in that same position. Imagine that you have an anarchist territory where an anarchist militia army is fighting against the capitalist army. And then you have people who are saying, okay, we know that the revolution is going on, but we're going to exploit this situation and we are not going to work tirelessly and selflessly for the goals of the revolution and we're not going to sacrifice our comfort. Instead, we're going to stab the revolution in the back by demanding more things for ourselves. Now, are you going to call these people a heroic worker opposition? Probably not. You're going to look at them and you're going to say, this is a small group of individualists. And when everybody else is literally dying out there, working their ass off, working overtime, doing volunteer work for free, so that the revolutionary government is going to win, and these people are demanding more money and they're actually striking, they're willing to go on strike against the socialist government so that they can get more money or so that they can pursue their own political interest. Yeah, you're just going to call them individualists. Meanwhile, this is what the communists did and what everybody should do. Quote, Saratov, June 5th. In response to the appeal of their Moscow comrades, the communist railway workers here at the general party meeting resolved to work five hours overtime on Saturdays without pay in order to support the national economy." Unquote. 